for another special subgroup to add to our constructions of new groups from old groups. We have the commutator subgroup G bracket with G, where G is a group. Now we define the commutator subgroup. It's going to be the subgroup generated by all commutators of G. So the commutators are just going to be elements of the form x, y, x inverse, y inverse, where x and y are in G. Now, we have to say subgroup generated by the commutators because the set of commutators themselves might not be a subgroup. For us, that's not going to be a problem. This doesn't occur for finite groups until we get to order of our group equal to 96. Now, what's the motivation here? So this seems kind of like an odd way to define things. I want to consider G mod the commutator subgroup. So what's happening when we form a quotient group? Well, the identity element of the quotient group is just going to be your normal subgroup n itself. So somehow you're setting your normal subgroup n to the identity. So if we take each commutator, set it equal to the identity, what happens? I could push the x inverse y inverse to the other side, and we have the relation that xy is equal to yx. Now, if we consider that for all x and y in the group, what we're doing is we're turning our quotient group into an abelian group. So this is going to be a recipe for turning g non-abelian into an abelian group by considering the quotient g mod the commutator of g. We'll have more details to add to this, but first, let's do some proofs. First proof, proposition, we want to show that the commutator subgroup of G is a normal subgroup. Now, for the subgroup property, you get that pretty much for free. So, if we take a subgroup generated by a set of elements, that's just going to be the intersection of all subgroups that contain them elements. So, done, but that's not going to give us any intuition. So let's do it the long way by showing our three properties. First, for the closure under multiplication, that we have to get from the definition. We're taking all elements that are commutators, all of their inverses, and then we're taking all possible products of those elements. For inverses, so let's suppose I have a product of these commutator elements. Now, our rule for inversion is, if we just have two, we reverse the order of the elements and then put inverses on them. Here, okay, you use the same rule with any number of elements. You reverse the order of the whole list and then put inverses on each element. We also need, if I take the inverse of x inverse, we just get x back. So when I apply that rule and the other rule to this list, we're going to reverse the order, put an inverse on each of them, if there's no inverse, it picks one up. If there is an inverse, we drop it. So that's going to give us this product here. And we note these are all commutators. Now, we still have to show non-empty, and we do that by checking the identity element. So if I take the commutator of the identity with itself, then we're just going to get okay, a product of four identity elements. So that's going to be the identity and our commutator subgroup is always non-empty. For the normal property, same idea. I would take a product like this, we conjugate by a G in the group, and then we show that that gives us another commutator list of products. Okay, for here we'll just show it for a single commutator and then you can extend the rest. Now the trick here, okay, we're gonna pick our G in the group, we have our commutator, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill in each space between the x, y, x inverse, and y inverse with the identity, written as g inverse g. So when I do that, you'll note, I can start grouping our items in threes. So for the first two groups, no problem. For the second two groups, we want the inverses in there, and we just use the trick we used before. We reverse the order of the list, and then we put an inverse on each element, and we see that's going to give us another commutator. So if we conjugate, commutators go back into commutators. So normal. 
Now, because the commutator subgroup is normal, we could form the quotient group. This quotient group gets a special name, the abelianization of G. Gets its name for the following two reasons. First, this quotient group is abelian. Then, if we take any other quotient group of G, say G mod N with N normal, if that's abelian, then we must have that the commutator subgroup is a subgroup of N. So this means the abelianization is the largest abelian quotient group for G. Now, as an application, this turns up in algebraic topology when we study the fundamental group. Let's see our two assertions. For the first one, we want to show abelian. So we're going to show if we take any two cosets, if we multiply in one order, it's the same as if we multiply in the opposite order. So we'll take coset for x, coset for y. We have a normal subgroup, so we have multiplication just given as we think we would. So xy commutator subgroup. Now we use a trick. If I have subgroup h, I pick any element in the subgroup. Then if we multiply that element by our subgroup, this set is just equal to h itself. That follows from closure under multiplication. So I'm allowed to pull elements out of our subgroup and keep the set the same. So here we're going to pull out the element. Okay, here we have the commutator subgroup. So I'm going to pull out the commutator y inverse x inverse y x. Now, this is going to cancel with the xy, leaving us with y x, and then we can pull this apart as coset for y, coset for x. So we just switch the order, so abelian. For the second assertion, we'll assume we have quotient group g mod n, abelian, so n is normal. Since it's abelian, we're just going to take the product of cosets in either order, set them equal. Then we just do our usual product, so I have xyn equals yxn, and we could push okay, the xy to the other side. So that'll give me y inverse x inverse yx times n is equal to n. Now, in this n, we have the identity element. So that's going to mean that this commutator lives somewhere in this side. So that means every commutator is going to be in our subgroup n. So the commutator subgroup is a subgroup of n. For concrete examples, if g is abelian, Okay, so we can multiply our elements in any order that we like. For a given commutator, we can move things around so they cancel in pairs, leaving us with the identity element. So our commutator subgroup is the trivial subgroup. For the quotient group, we just get our group back. So the cosets here are going to be the singletons with the identity. We multiply by x out in front. So these are just going to be the singletons for each element of the group. If we let g be equal to s3, so now we're not abelian again, we have the symmetry group of the equilateral triangle. If we work out a few commutators, we see that the commutator subgroup is just going to be the subgroup of rotations. So we have the identity element and our two three cycles. Now, if we were to just guess blindly at what the commutator subgroup was, you'd have a one in three shot. Okay, the only normal subgroups for S3 are trivial, this rotation subgroup, and the group itself. Now, if we consider all the quotient groups, so if we take the one with the commutator, okay, we're going to have two elements in here, which means we have an abelian quotient group, okay, group with two elements. If we took the identity, well, that's just going to be the group itself, and S3 is not abelian. Okay, we note the commutator is not contained in the trivial subgroup. Finally, if we take the group itself, okay, we take this quotient, we just have a one element group, so it's just the identity element. That's definitely abelian, and we note that the commutator is certainly contained in S3 itself. So that checks out. Now, for a non-trivial example, let's consider 
Okay, we have the dihedral group with two n elements. So we have the symmetries of a regular n-gon. So for the picture, we'll just use a hexagon. Now, for us, it's going to be convenient to use the notation of generators and relations. So for our group, okay, for our two n elements, everything's completely described in the following way. We're going to have the rotation that carries 1 to 2. I'll call that R. That's going to be an element of order n. We're going to have an element C, which is going to be the reflection through this horizontal line. That's going to be an element of order 2. And then for the multiplication, if I have C times R and I want to switch, I just change the R to R inverse. Now with that, every element in our group looks like this. For the rotations, we have the identity element and all powers of R. Then for the reflections, we're just going to have each rotation and just multiply the front by our C. So that'll give us our two N elements in the group. Now, for commutators, if I consider a rotation with a rotation, well, they commute with each other, so the commutators that come out from there are going to be the identity elements. So not interesting. If I try a rotation with a reflection, okay, so we just write things out. I have R to the L, C, R to the K. So we'll have X, Y, X inverse, Y inverse, a note for Y inverse, switch the order, put the inverse on both terms. Since C is of order two, C equals C inverse. Then, okay, we just use our relations here, and this collapses down to R squared raised to the L minus K power. If we consider both X and Y reflections, do the same computation, and again we get R squared, and now the exponent's K minus L. In either case, the commutators are all going to be powers of R squared. So our commutator subgroup is going to be generated by R squared. Now, two things can happen here. If n is odd, then the subgroup generated by R squared is going to be all rotations. So it's just going to be the subgroup generated by R. And this subgroup has n elements. If we're in the case where n is even, then subgroup generated by R squared is just a subgroup generated by R squared. So we have R squared, R fourth, R sixth, R eighth. So we get all the way around to R to two N, which is the identity. So this subgroup is gonna have N over two elements. How about the quotient groups? The order of our quotient groups, we take the order of the group, divide by the order of the commutator subgroup. So when N is odd, we'll have two elements, when n is even, we'll have four elements. Now, when n is odd, let's take a look at the cosets. For the identity coset, we're going to have every rotation. So for our other coset, I could just multiply by the element C. So I'll call that C bar, the identity coset E bar. So that gives us a partition of the group, as promised. So that's our check. E bar is going to be our identity element. And for C bar, note, if we take C squared, we get the identity. So we'll have the same property for C bar. So that means we have a two element group. And note, this is abelian. For N even, we'll have four cosets. For the identity coset, we just have the commutator subgroup. So this is generated by all powers of R squared. For another element, we can get coset given by R times the commutator subgroup. I'll call that R bar. Okay, so that's odd powers of R. And then we also have C times our subgroup and CR times our subgroup. To check, we have a partition here. Let's take a look at the group elements themselves. Okay, so we have our identity coset. We'll call that E bar. If I take R bar and square it, an element in this coset is going to be R squared, and that shows up in our identity coset. Now, because cosets are either equal or have disjoint intersection, that means R squared is equal to the identity coset. Similar manner, we can see that the squares of our other two elements are also the identity element. Now, if 
we're looking for an abelian group with this property, then we're looking at Z2 cross Z2. Okay, the direct product is Z2 with itself. 